three Harlem kids, born into poverty, became kings of New York. Like Nicky Barnes, Bumpy Johnson, and Frank Lucas before them. Alpo Martinez, Richie Porter, and AZ Faison practically owned their own city blocks. But only one would rise to the level of the gangsters they chose to follow. He started at a very, very young age. I think he may have uh, started as early as 14, distributing or running drugs for different organizations there. Proved he could be trusted and then just gradually moved up the ladder. He got to the top rung by being both nice and ruthless. He would draw people to him, get them to trust him. He started out as a hustler, selling small bottles of cocaine on street corners to users and small-time dealers who turned the product into crack. When we, we went to buy the bottles, you know, we wasn't buying a pack. We would come out of there with, like, you know, dollies, a whole bunch of shit. It was like, it was nuts, man. See this, this, these little doors? It was a door right there before they remodeled that building. It was a spot right there, like a storefront. That was my game room called the Video Jukebox. We would put the money in the game and come back with more drugs and sell it. But this place used to be crowded with customers. A lot of drugs being sold out of there. Good dope sell itself. If you got the best, you ain't really got to do all that foolishness. Well, you playing defense more so than offense when you got some good you know, You know, you being hunted, that's where I stood. I knew I had the best. They hid the cocaine inside games like Pac-Man and Asteroid in case of a raid. Not just from the cops. You got stick-up kids out there. You got a lot of people, a lot of creeps in that crowd just as well, man. So you want to stay as low off the radar as much as possible. And this was how the cocaine brotherhood began to break apart. Alpo Martinez was an individual that just loved the limelight, and that was what caused a lot of issues. Alpo liked good things, nice things, but wow. Get a motorcycle, buy a brand new bike with a crowd as that do wheelies crash it, and the next day go buy another motorcycle. This, you know, that's, that's who he was. Spent a lot of money on fireworks, thousands of dollars, 10,000, and just come uptown and light it up. But he, he liked it, that attention. And in the game, we don't need that. So I was always, oh, this crazy. You understand? Me and Rich want to stay as low off the radar as much as possible, man. But for some reason, he, he couldn't understand that, man. The first king to suffer for their fame and their stature was the least likely. This is the building right here, Joy and Blue. My aunt used to live there. There was three people. My sister's boyfriend at the time. He, he set me up, you understand? He tried to rob me. Hazy Faison survived a brutal assault. Nine bullet wounds, two to the head. While AZ turned away from the game, Alpo just turned his attention south. A business opportunity opened up in Washington, D.C., just months before the attack on AZ. Rafael Edmonds was, at the time, the biggest deal we had in Washington. He was responsible for maybe 70 percent, 80 percent. It's difficult to measure, but of bringing all the cocaine into D.C. Rafael Edmonds was arrested in April 1989. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole, just one month after the shooting in the Bronx that nearly killed AZ. The vacuum left by disruption of Rafael Evans' organization left the way clear for someone else, another drug kingpin, to emerge and take control of the market. The mayor of Harlem set his sights on expanding his business into the nation's capital. Alpo was going to D.C., making a lot of money, and, you know, I saw it for myself. I'm bringing in duffel bags of money from D.C. You know, Rich still working with him. Alpo and Richie Porter still shared business and suppliers. 
Martinez. He'd get hundreds of kilos of cocaine in New York City at 18,000 a kilo and just flip them here in DC for $3,000 profit per each kilo. His cost was essentially a five hour drive to Washington DC and maybe an hour it took to find his customers. I mean, he had just as many connections. Uh, he could put his hands on just as much cash as Rayful. Alpo changed his game in the new market. He stopped selling little bottles on the street corner and started selling kilos of cocaine to many of Rayful Edmonds' old customers. He would return to New York to buy more product, sometimes to Richie Porter. He tried to convince Rich to come with him, but the new business put a distance between the two old friends. Rich allegedly overcharged him from three to 5,000 a key. Now, when you're buying 100 or 200 keys, that's a, that adds up to a lot of money. Rich ain't in the game working for free. Nobody was following any rules. And obviously, uh, when that happens, uh, they were all reaching for their nine millimeters. That week, Alpo was in New York. With one of his hitmen at his side, he confronted Porter and accused him of overcharging. Rich denied it two, three, four times. And finally, um, be, feeling that Rich Porter shorted him money, Alpo got him in the car and drove him to Orchard Beach. One of his subordinates shoots Rich Porter in the head, and he doesn't die. So Alpo Martinez walks up to him and shoots him several times in the head. Why you got to kill him? You're not even looking at life no more, bro. The game's turning you into a cold-blooded monster, man. Once upon a time, there were three kings from Harlem. One gave up the game after surviving two bullets to the head. The second king lost his life after the third king took it. On November 8, 1991, Alpo Martinez was arrested after being pulled over on the south side of Washington, D.C. They didn't have any murder cases on Alpo, but they had a drug case that could put him away for life. And that's what got his attention. Under the federal kingpin statute, if the government could link the leader of a gang to killings ordered to further the criminal enterprise, the death penalty comes into play. Alpo knew that we were going to eventually solve these murders. He was a pretty good businessman when it comes to assessing risks. And so his risk assessment drove him to make a business decision that he should strike a deal with the government because he had information to trade. And boy, did he. All told, Alpo admitted to ordering 14 killings. The one that, uh, that I saw that I thought he uh, was most remorseful for and uh, showed any emotion at all, really, was Richie Porter. It took a long time to get to the point of him confessing to Richie Porter's murder. And uh, he just finally said, hey, I did it. I never lose sight of the fact that he's responsible for 14 incredibly brutal murders and ran a huge drug trafficking organization that preyed upon the addictions and misery of other people just so that he could make a fortune. Essentially, you have to do a deal with the devil, a guy that probably should be doing life in prison, a guy that probably should have gotten the death penalty. Despite cooperating, he was sentenced to 35 years. With good behavior, he can get out in the year 2019. When you look in the mirror, question is, who are you, man? Could you live with yourself? I respect the game. But I know the game don't respect nobody, man. For real, you got to stop, or you'll be stopped, eventually. It ain't no excuses. Excuses be gone. That's how I see it. <laughs>